Now, Itisham, one one quick uh, question because you did give a number of verses. I didn't I didn't write down the verses that you yeah. mentioned from the from the Quran, which say that the Bible has been corrupted. But I remember you referencing some verses. Uh, could you could you kind of uh, give us the ones you think are most are most clear, and then and then Sam can. All right. Uh, the Quran chapter 2 verse 75, Quran chapter 2 uh, verse 9, Quran chapter 3 verse 78, Quran chapter 3 verse 100, 187, uh, Quran chapter 5 verse 13 through 15 through 14 talks about the corruption of the scriptures of the Jews and Christians as confirmed by Tafsir ibn Kathir, uh, Quran chapter 6 verse uh, 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 91. And if you want to know why, uh, what the Quran is talking about by the Torah and the Injil, I can, I can get into that if, if you want. All right, Sam. On the issue of what the Quran says about the Bible, go ahead and go ahead and, and share yes. your thoughts. And if you want, if sure. you want me to pull up any verses for you, I can. Other sure. than that, I'll, I'll probably yeah, stay it. out of it. Yeah. Notice what he did here. He says that Muhammad confirms the corruption of Scripture, but then he appealed to the Bible to prove that Muhammad is a prophet. Classic uh, case of circular reasoning. Did you guys hear what he said? Yeah. Muhammad confirmed that the Bible is corrupt, and he quoted certain evangelical scholars out of context. He quoted Craig Blomberg out of context, and I'm going to press him on that to quote Blomberg in context. So make sure you have his book ready. With the page number so we can read in context what Blomberg actually said. But guys, hear it. This is the beauty of Islamic apologetics. Muhammad confirms the Bible's corrupt and Muhammad is a prophet because he fulfills biblical criteria for prophethood. So a corrupt Bible confirms that Muhammad is a true prophet who then confirms that the Bible's corrupt. Masterful. I mean, honestly, I think this was going to convince many people to take Shahada. But every passage that you quoted from the Quran was misquoted. None of those passages, and this is why I want to engage you, say that Muhammad taught the Bible's corrupt. Now, I'm going to just go to chapter 2 of the Quran, and I want you to write these down, the Tisham, because these are your verses from the same chapter, chapter 2, that you're going to have to address in context because you misquoted 275. You took it out of context. Write down chapter 2, verses 40 to 44, chapter 2, verse 89 and 91, chapter 2, verse 97, Chapter 2, verse 101, chapter 2, verse 113, chapter 2, verse 136, and that's just in chapter 2. Again, you misquoted chapter 3, verse 78 of the Quran. You wrenched it out of context as well as chapter 3, verse 187. So here I'm going to ask you to write down chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Write these down because you're going to have to engage these texts. Your own Quran, which you quoted out of context to make it say something it didn't. Chapter 3, verse 48. Chapter 3, verse 50. Chapter 3, verse 113 to 114. Then he went to chapter 5 and misquoted chapter 5, verse 13 out of context to make it say something that the context says it cannot be saying unless you believe the Quran is full of contradictions. And it is, but for other reasons. So write down chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 43 to 48. Chapter 5, verse 66. And chapter 5, verse 68. Write those passages down. And then again, you did it with chapter 6, verse 91. You again quoted it out of context. So again, I'm going to help you read your own Quran in context. Go to chapter 6 of the Quran, verses 114 and 115. 6, 114 and 115. And unlike you, I'd like to engage these texts and read them to see what they say. But for the sake of time, 6, verses 114 and 115. And then add these as brownie points. Chapter 10, verse 37 of the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran. Chapter 12, verse 111 of the Quran. Add that. Then add chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran. Cross-reference that with chapter 16, verse 43 of the Quran. And chapter 21, verse 7 of the Quran. And then icing on the cake chapter 46, verse 12, and verse 30 of the Quran. All of which say that one of the proofs that your prophet was a true prophet, it's not that he confirmed the Bible's corrupt. He actually confirmed the Bible was incorruptible, that the scriptures the preserved and authoritative and to be used to judge Muhammad and also to live according to their dictates. So you're wrong. Muhammad did not say the Bible is corrupt. That's your misreading of the Quran, which is why you had to run to Ibn Kathir. But when did Ibn Kathir come? He didn't come in the time of your prophet. He didn't even come in the 9th century, nor did he come in the 10th century. Ibn Kathir is about 700 years removed from the time that your prophet died. So talk about being desperate. You have to go to someone who comes about 700 years later, who assumes that the Bible's corrupt, and then he misreads the passages like you do to prove biblical corruption. But conveniently, you didn't mention Ibn Qayyim, because both Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Kathir were both students of Ibn Taymiyyah. But Ibn Qayyim says that even at his time, there are a group of scholars, Muslim scholars, who say that at least in the case of the Torah, the Torah is incorruptible. Why? Because they use chapter 6, verse 115 to prove. It says, none changing the words of Allah. And Ibn Qayyim said that those scholars, Ibn uh, Qayyim, said those scholars use that verse to show because the Torah is the word of Allah, it cannot be changed. Those same scholars, Muslim scholars, at the same time, contemporary with Ibn Kathir, quoted this hadith from Abu Dawood. In the English, it's number 44, verse 34. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar, a group of Jews came and invited the Apostle of Allah to Kuf. So he visited them in their school. They said, Abu Qasim, 
One of our men has committed fornication with a woman, so pronounce judgment upon them. They placed the cushion for the apostle of Allah, who sat on it and said, bring the Torah. It was then brought, their copy of the Torah. He took it and he says, he then withdrew the cushion from beneath him, placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and him who revealed you. Ibn Qayyim, not me, not David Wood, said, the scholars of Islam, the scholars of Islam. I hear somebody talking to my... Who's talking? Okay. Yeah, it's not. Please okay. don't talk over me. I didn't do that with you at the time. All right. Anyway, listen. The scholars of Islam said he would not have said, I believe in the Torah and in him who revealed it, it was corrupted. So you selectively cite those scholars that agree with you, but then you ignore the scholars who refute you. And the scholars I cite that refute you, they're right because the Quran agrees. The Bible is incorruptible and it is the standard to judge Muhammad. And you even implicitly agreed. Why? Because you went to the biblical criteria to prove he's a prophet. Why would you, if you're not assuming that Muhammad has to live up to the criteria of the biblical revelation, but he fails miserably? Because why does he fail? I'm going to use the very passages you cite against you. You mentioned Deuteronomy 13. You said that a criteria, one of the criteria to prove that someone is a prophet, he must preach the same God. Sorry to burst your bubble. Muhammad did not preach the same God of Deuteronomy, which is why you're not going to say it's corrupt. But when you say it's corrupt, you prove my point. Muhammad is a false prophet, which is why you have to argue biblical corruption. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1, it says that the Israelites are the sons of God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, it says that God is their spiritual father who spiritually begot them. And Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20 says that he is the rock that gave them birth spiritually, not physically, because God is not a physical being. And they are his sons and daughters who proved perverse. The same Pentateuch, because Deuteronomy is part of the collection called Pentateuch. In Exodus 4, verse 22, it says that Israel is my firstborn. Let my son go to worship me. And if you don't let my firstborn go, go I'll kill your firstborn. God speaking through Moses to Pharaoh. So according to that very book, the God of Moses is a spiritual father to the Israelites. The Israelites are his sons and daughters that he gave birth spiritually to. But your prophet, your Muhammad, in chapter 5, verse 18 says, the Jews are not the sons of Allah, neither are the Christians. Your prophet, your Muhammad said that no one is a son to Allah. The highest relationship they can have with your God is a slave to master relationship. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. So the very Deuteronomy 13 you cited, so you can't now backpedal, condemns Muhammad as a false prophet, as an antichrist. And then you had the audacity to go to John 1. My goodness, you went to John 1 saying another criteria to prove that a prophet is a true prophet. He denies that he's Elijah and he's the, he denies he's the Christ. That is a gross perversion of John 1, 19 to 25. There is no criterion given in John 1, 19 to 25. What it's saying is to John the Baptist, are you the Elijah? No. Are you the Christ? No. Are you the prophet? No. That's all it's saying. But it's ironic you use John 1. Now you're stuck with it at Tisham. You better not backpedal and tell me it's corrupt. Because that's the same John where John the Baptist said that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who is before me and greater than I, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus Christ is the Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, all of which you deny and the prophet deny. So according to John 1, Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist condemned to the pit of hell, according to John 1, who quoted it. So I want you to say, you agree with John 1, that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that he's the Son of God who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and that he's Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, because that's what John the Baptist says in that very chapter that you quoted out of context. Now, I don't know how much more time I have, David, because um, I will have a field day with this at a point. Yeah, I, I know you could, yeah, it's, uh, I know, basically, Etishem, Etishem brought up a bunch of points, and I know you would have something to, to say on Let's all of these see. points, but I kind of like to uh, probably go through one point at a time. So, uh, right. Itisham, on the, the Bible. on this particular issue of Ma what Muhammad thought about the Bible, what did you? What would your response to Sam be? All right, so let's deal with the whole Torah, the Prophet confirming the Torah mm -hmm. uh, hadith. That hadith is actually a weak because you don't. Uh, no, uh, no. You're, you're going to a weak source, anyways. Abu Dawood does have weak hadith. In it, um, you know, like the whole sun setting in the muddy spring, that's a weak hadith that was accurately classified as Sa'i and things like that. And if you want the scholars who say that, it's yeah, give it to me because I have Al Albani it. saying it's not weak. So are you making things up? I have it right here. Yeah. Sunnah.com. Well, let me make my comment. Tisham, let me make my comment. On uh, Sunnah.com, it gives the grading. It's not Da'if. Give me the grading. That's Al Albani's classification. Secondly, are you telling me that Ibn Qayyim, now I want you to answer this, is an ignoramus who is a moron, 
And the scholars he cited were ignoramuses and morons because he said the scholars quoted this hadith from Abu Dawud to prove that the Torah is not corrupt. And are you saying that Ibn Kathir, whom you cited, is another idiot? Because if you go to Tafsir Ibn Kathir, open it up, chapter 5, verse 41, in him, he cites that hadith and he doesn't say it's weak. So now I'm going to call out your bluff. Give me the name of the scholar that says this is daif, it cannot be used. Ibn Qayyim and the scholars of his day said it's not daif. Ibn Kathir, open it up, I have it in front of me. You have him with you? Open it up. Chapter 5, verse 41. He cites the hadith and doesn't say it's daif. So why are you making up the classifications as you go along? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, this whole argument is dead. Like Muslims have already refuted it. But Ibn Hazm in his book, uh, al Fisil, Al-Malil, Al-Walal, Al-Mahil, volume 1, page 437. I know I butchered the Arabic. But even he says that, uh, you know, it's a fabricated report that reached us with false without a proper chain of transmission. So Ibn Hazm says that Hadith is weak anyways. Uh, you know, so even if you want to think it's authentic or whatever, according to Ibn Hajar, who, you know, I know it's saying it refers to the original Torah that was revealed to Moses. That's not the Old Testament. That's some uh, revealed scripture revealed to Moses. So, you know, so scholars have different interpretations of that. It doesn't mean what you want it to mean. It's not... It's not even authentic according to some Muslim scholars, anyways. So, uh, no. Are, you want me to address it now? Uh, I, I just, I just wanted to clarify. You, I just wanted to clarify because there, there will, there are viewers who don't know what you guys are talking about right now. So, to be clear, you're talking about the hadith from Sunan Abu Dawud right now, from the, the one that where where yes. Muhammad tells the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah. Is that, is that the, you're both addressing that one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so everyone, just okay, let just, just yeah, just, just let me tell people what that hadith is about, and then they can understand what the what the dispute is about. In in that hadith, the Jews uh, are having a dispute about about uh, they want Muhammad to judge a dispute they're having. Muhammad tells them to bring a copy of the Torah, and then Muhammad uh, sits on a kind of judgment cushion that signifies that he's the judge in the dispute. So he tells the judge to bring the I mean, he tells the Jews to bring a Torah. The Jews bring him a copy of the Torah. And Muhammad says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you after putting the, uh, the Torah on the judgment cushion. So the suggestion is that the, um, that the, the Torah is their actual judge. And so uh, the perspective of people who say that, uh, that Muhammad affirmed the reliability of the Jewish scriptures is that, well, Muhammad said he believes in in the Torah there, and he's talking about a physical copy that existed during the time um, of, of the seventh century. And so, and so the, the, the criticism would be, well, what's he really talking about there? Uh, is, he, is he just affirming the Torah or is he affirming the entire Old Testament? And then in addition to that, is, the, is that Hadith reliable? So is that a real situation that Muhammad actually said that in and that's kind of that's kind of the issue. Yeah. That's that's kind of the that, that's the issue they're discussing. I just wanted people to understand what, what you guys are talking about right now. Okay, guys, I just gave you the classification. Sunnah.com. It's not run by Christians or Jews. Grade Hassan Al Albani. If you guys don't know who Al Albani is, Muslim scholars, specifically the Salafi, consider him to be one of the greatest not scholars of the 20th century. Sheikh Al Albani. Hassan. That means it's good. It's not daif. Even daif doesn't mean it's not true, because then I'm going to have to talk about the classification, how even Sunni scholars say daif means passing. It's it passed, but this is hasan. That's number one. Number two, Ibn Kathir, whom you cited, you cited Ibn Kathir, open up to his exposition of chapter 5, verse 41. I have him. It's in my articles that you claim was refuted. Far from it. They failed to refute anything. Glory to Jesus Christ. 541, Ibn Kathir cites the same hadith. To explain the context of chapter 5, Surat Al-Maida, when the Jews came to him for judgment. And he doesn't say it's forged or it's weak. But beyond that, Ibn Qayyim, companion of Ibn Kathir, both of them the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Qayyim says, there are a group of scholars who use that hadith as proof the Torah has not been corrupt. So you're stuck with it. You, Shabir and Basam, you're stuck with it. It's a nightmare for you guys. I understand. But come on over to the truth and reject Islam and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But let's go beyond that. You just told everyone that it's referring to the original Torah given to Moses. No, the Hadith is talking about the copy of the Torah in the hands of the Jews. He said, bring me your Torah. But thank you because you just implicitly admit that has to be the Torah of Moses. Because if he's confirming it, that means they have accurate copies of the Torah given to Moses. So you just made my point. But finally, and here's my challenge to you. Tisham, open up your Quran. 
Show me a sentence in your Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses. I'm not asking you to show me where the Quran says a book was given to Moses. Kitab. I know the Quran says a kitab was given to Moses. You said Torah was given to Moses. Quote the verse and show me the Arabic where it says, and the Torah we sent down to Moses. Show me that. And if you can't show me that, where did you get that information from? So that's my challenge. Please, please answer my question. Uh, Quran chapter 3 verse 3. Hang on. And it doesn't say Torah given to Moses. I know the Arabic. It says it confirms the Torah and the gospel. So again, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm trying to help you avoid answering the question directly. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verse 3 to 4 does not say the Torah is given to Moses. It says the Torah and the gospel were given as guidance and light to mankind. I'm going to repeat the question one more time. Show me in the Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses, like in chapter 5, verse 46, it says the gospel was given to Jesus. See, the Quran is clear. The gospel we gave to Jesus. Show me where it says the Torah we gave to Moses. Don't quote me a verse where it says Torah. I know it's there. Torah given to Moses. Give me the verse. Uh, okay, yeah. So the Quran... Um the Quran chapter two verse seventy. Uh, the Quran chapter two verse fifty three says we gave Moses the scripture. So, you know, I mean, uh, so what, what, like, and then the Quran chapter forty six verse twelve. Uh, yeah. So you know. So, but regardless, uh, you know, we Muslims don't believe that the Old Testament was revealed to Moses. Uh, you know, like the like the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. We don't believe that, anyways. So I, I don't I don't know what your argument is. What's your what's your argument? Okay, <clears throat> notice what you said right now. You just said we don't believe the Old Testament was given to Moses. You believe the Torah was given to Moses, and you just quoted two verses that says a book was given to Moses. How do you know that even though the book of Isaiah is attributed to Isaiah for argument's sake? Because remember what you said. I want you to hold you consistent. The Old Testament, New Testament, they're corrupt. So how do you know that the book of Isaiah wasn't falsely attributed to Isaiah, but it was actually written by Moses? Because the Quran doesn't tell you what was given to Moses. How do you know the Torah was given to Moses? Where'd you get that information? See, if you don't know that answer, I'll show you why I'm asking you the question. Because you said, I want everyone to hear it. We believe the original Torah given to Moses. No, you don't, because the Quran doesn't tell you any original Torah was given to Moses. How do you know it was given to Moses? How do you know what book was given to whom? You're not told the Torah was given to Moses. The only thing you're told in the Quran is that the gospel is given to Jesus and that David wrote Psalms. Let me give you the verses there. Chapter 4, verse 163 of the Quran and chapter 17, verse 55 says that to David we gave the Psalms and to Jesus we gave the gospel. So how do you know who the Torah was given to? It says a book was given to Moses. Well, what's that book? How do you know what book was given to Moses? So this is what I'm asking. Because when you answer, you're going to show that you're dependent on my Bible to fill out the gaps in your Quran, the very Bible that in one breath you want to use to prove Muhammad, but then condemn it because it exposes Muhammad. So how do you know what was given to Moses? How do I know what was given to Moses? Well, we got to do some reasoning here. We got to know what the Quran's talking about and uh, things like that. So Allah is clearly saying he gave the, the Torah or the revelation to Moses, but that revelation is not the Old Testament. So... Uh, you know, according to Tafsirs, according to Hadith, and uh, things like that. Again, keep in mind that we have to keep everything in its proper context. We have to keep everything within its proper uh, understanding, what the Muslim scholars have understood. And the Muslim scholars have always understood that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. Uh, you know, so, I mean, uh, if you read Tafsir Ibn Kathir, uh, you know, Ibn Abbas, all these, you know, early Muslim scholars don't agree with your view. So, like, uh, so, like, what's your argument here? Okay, like, let, me, let me respond. Okay, Ittisham, this is now the third time I just said. Ibn Qayyim, who is a contemporary of Ibn Kathir, says there's a group of scholars that said the Torah is incorruptible. Why do you keep saying that this is the view of the Muslim scholars? The early Muslim scholars don't agree with me. They actually do agree with me. They disagree with you. Ibn Ishaq, that you tried to throw under the bus and went to Ibn Isham, he believed the Bible is not corrupt. Tabari believed the Bible wasn't corrupt. Ibn Qayyim mentioned scholars that said that the Torah is incorruptible. I just mentioned them. And you keep telling me all the scholars are on your side. No, they're not. Even Bukhari said the Bible is not corrupt. And I have the citations in front of me. And you know who told me that Bukhari said that the scriptures are incorruptible? Ibn Qayyim. He quotes Bukhari. He even says, Ar-Razi. Ar-Razi says that the Torah is incorruptible. So where are you getting that all the scholars, all the commentators agree with you? No, they don't. There were scholars that agreed the Bible's not corrupt, but then as they saw the problem, the Bible as it existed at that time exposes Muhammad as a fraud, then they had to then adopt the approach, well, that means the scriptures were corrupted. No, it means Muhammad is a fraud. 
Doesn't mean the scriptures are corrupted, especially when the Quran agrees that the scriptures are incorruptible, preserved, and the scriptures of the Jews and Christians were the pure words of God that Muhammad appealed to to verify his claims. So stop saying that the commentators are on your side. They're not. In fact, here I'm going to prove it to you. If you have Ibn Kathir, I want you to read for me what Ibn Kathir says about Jesus confirming the Torah between his hands. And here are the references. Please write these down. And if you have the English translation, you don't need to know the Arabic. In chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran, 48 and 50, what does Ibn Kathir say about Jesus confirming the Torah? Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 5, verse 46? And then what does he say about Jesus confirming the Torah in chapter 61, verse 6? There, Ibn Kathir, in those three passages, actually there are four, but I count th chapter 3, it's 48 and 50 as one. He says that Jesus confirmed, upheld, lived up to the Torah in his possession. Because in the Arabic, if you read it, it says Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. It's musaddiqan. Lima baina yadehi. Sadaqa, the verb to mean confirm and bear witness to the truth thereof. Between his hands. Baina yadehi. So that's an Arabic idiomatic expression meaning the Torah that he had access to and read. So Ibn Kathir, the one you're quoting, tells me the historical Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession and didn't say a single word about its being corrupt. Now, Ittisham, I'm going to challenge you. Give me a single manuscript or any textual proof that the Torah that Jesus confirmed, it is so vastly different from the Torah we read and the Torah the Jews had that Muhammad confirmed. Show me that it's completely different. It isn't virtually the same that I have today. And please, Ittisham, do me a favor. Don't appeal to variant readings because you know the crisis in Islam now with all the qirat, all the variant readings and all the corruption to the Quranic manuscripts. So please don't go there with the variant readings. Save us the time from having to go into the corruption of the Quran because it's not going to go well. Let's stick with this. Is there any manuscript proof that Jesus confirmed an Old Testament other than what I read today? What's the proof? Notice how like, Ibn Abbas says Jesus was taught the Torah in, in the womb, in, the, in his womb. He wasn't. He wasn't confirming a physical copy, according to Ibn Abbas's uh, view. So, uh, so like, regardless, you know, we follow the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, the, and like, we follow like what the Salaf, the first three generations, say, and all of them agree with my view that the uh, Torah and the Gospel is corrupt. So, I mean, it, even the Prophet Muhammad himself. I just said that Hadith that. The Prophet Muhammad said that the Jews and Christians have corrupted the scriptures, and the Quran says follow the Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, so why are you going to, okay. you know, why are you going to Jesus when we follow the Prophet Muhammad? Okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I wasn't clear. Nothing in what you cited from Ibn Abbas says that Jesus confirmed a Torah that God taught him directly in the womb and not the physical copy. Let me repeat it again. Chapter 3, verses 48 and 50. Specifically, verse 50, and he says... Supposedly Jesus saying, because you believe in Jesus, uh, says speaks in the Quran. That's you believe that. You believe that's Jesus speaking in the Quran. I don't, but since you believe it, in chapter three, verse fifty and sixty-one, verse six, Jesus speaking to the Jews, he says, I confirm the Torah between my hands. So you're actually seriously wanting us to believe that Jesus was saying, Hey, I'm confirming some Torah that I memorize in the womb, but not the Torah that you have. You're making mincemeat out of the Quran because the Quran says, Jesus confirmed the Torah and said to the Jews, O children of Israel, I'm a messenger sent by your Lord to confirm the Torah between my hands. To the Jews hearing Jesus, they're going to say, Oh, you mean the Torah that we have, right? You're confirming that? Can you show me where in the Quran Jesus says, No, 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 no. I'm not confirming your Torah. I'm confirming the one taught to me while I was in the womb, but not what you have. You're, you're reading too much into Ibn Abbas, and you're reading out of the Quran what the Quran plainly teaches. He was confirming whatever Torah they had that the Jews were reading. And then moreover, Nowhere did Muhammad say that the scriptures are corrupt. You still didn't give me a verse. You misinterpreted what Muhammad said. And then you said that the first three generations agreed with you. No, they didn't. Wahab bin Munabbah. He is a follower of the, of the Sahaba. Wahab bin Munabbah. In the very verse you have referred to. Please prove me wrong. I've been challenging you. Open up Ibn Kathir. Go to chapter 3, verse 78. There, Ibn Kathir mentions Wahab bin Munabbah. And he says, the Torah and the Gospel remain the same because Allah's books are uncorruptible. Why would you dare say in front of everyone that the first three generations agreed with you? Wahab bin Munabba is a tabi. He's a follower of the Sahaba, the follower of Muhammad's companions. And he says, Ittisham, either you're lying or you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Benefit of doubt, you don't know what you're talking about. He says, Torah and the Gospel remain as they are because Allah's books are incorruptible. They misinterpret them.